Welcome ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a new week of December, a new day. So there's a new Advent of Code puzzle. It's day five today. I'm excited to see what, what Eric has in store for us because the last few days have been quite chill. I'm not so sure about this day though. So let me just go into my coding environment as I always do. Not sure I have my files. Yes, I do. Let me get ready to enter my input. Perfect. Right, let's go. In five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Okay, that's part one done. Yeah, did a really big mess up there. Um, by forgetting to subtract the indices, probably lost me a couple of minutes. But I like that, that was good. Um, let me just copy the file, and uh, then I'll do part two. So see you after the time lapse. Right, yeah, that's part two. I made so many silly errors there. <laughs> um, definitely could have done that faster, but that was good. Yeah, that was good. I like that. Um, yeah, let's go back to the question. Um, day five. Okay, that did not work. Day five. Supply stacks. The expedition can depart as soon as the final supplies have been unloaded from the ships. Supplies are stored in stacks of marked crates. But because the needed supplies are buried under many other crates, the crates need to be rearranged. The ship has a giant cargo crane capable of moving crates between stacks. To ensure none of the crates get crushed or fall over, the crane operator will rearrange them in a series of carefully planned steps. At least someone's carefully planned, not the eldest, but the crane operator. After the crates are rearranged, the desired crates will be at the top of each stack. The elves don't want to interrupt the crane operator during this delicate procedure, but they forget to ask which crate will end up where. They've messed up yet again and they want to be ready to unload them as soon as possible so they can embark. They do, however, have a drawing of the starting stacks of crates and re rearrangement procedure. The elves always somehow have a drawing of something, which happens to be our puzzle input. Yeah, this is just an example. So the elves need to know which crate will end up on top of each stack. After the, re after the rearrangement procedure completes, what crate ends up at the top of each stack? Yeah, I mean, you can probably like read the, read the first one. They kind of look at some of the pictures. Def Right, I'm back. My Firefox just crashed. Probably something going on in my underwi other window, which I have to fix after this. But yeah, so what you do, what I did, is I just read this last sentence, looked at these pictures, especially these ones, like these, these really illustrate what's going on perfectly. And especially when you then read this bit, like it's really simple to see what's going on. And thankfully Eric made that nice and intuitive. Yeah, so the code. Um, let me just switch over the order. And it 
mid turn. Day 5, part A. Right. Because it's a bit more complicated today. Because um, they came with some really, really weird inputs. Um, so, you know, you just have to split the input up. I think this part is part a part of like the program that people may struggle with, splitting it up and formatting it. Just passing the input. So what you do, I, I did, is I split it up into two sessions based on the double um, the double line. Um, the X and Y, and then just split those parts into their respective lines. Right, so that's basically all the passing I really needed to do. It wasn't too hard to figure that bit out, to be honest. And then Q. Q is in my crates. Um, this is quite a neat trick in Python, the asterisk number. Uh, right after a list kind of repeats this like what that would actually end up doing is that just nine times um, it's quite a neat trick i quite like it definitely saves time when typing this stuff out okay so then you actually got to get like i guess there are some people who would have entered this manually <laughs> i'm not doing that so i guess we could to do that for you right here um so what it does is it goes from the bottom so from this bottom row upwards uh, that's what this outer for loop does and then this inner for loop, the nested one, this goes across. So once you're on a row, it goes from left to right across the row, um, starting on index one, and dropping across four indexes, because the letters are separated by four indexes, well, indices. And like even up here, like what's great about what Eric did is that these are like still empty spaces, and there are like the correct amount of them. Um, like instead of just chuck chucking a tab or something, he actually put spaces, which meant that you could use this index. Um, but obviously that meant that if you happen to like, if you're passing this top line for example, you start on F, you jump ahead four spaces, and all of a sudden you're in this blank character. Um, so that's what, in my code, that's what this is upper checks for. Um, just to ensure that what you're on is actually the letter. So it kind of just ignores these. But if it is an uppercase letter, um, then you just add that letter, so you add that letter to the end of the string, for the tower and so like the string kind of represents the tower and it's in order so the last the last item in the string is the one that's going to come out first um and just to like index it correctly i just thought of this pretty quickly quite happy it worked <laughs> um because you are just kind of see how far along the row you are and depending on how far you're along you are or how many four jobs you've done you're going to want to add the letter to the different um like tower number from one to nine. Yeah, and then these this just passes through Y, goes through Y, um, and this actually simulates it. So here, I mean, I kind of just take out all the values A to F. To be honest, there's probably a fast way to do that. Um, yeah, it wasn't a great way, but it worked. <laughs> and then because some of those are integers, um, so like the second, the fourth, and the sixth are all integers. And like they're the only letters you actually want, or like the only characters you actually want. Um, I can kind of just ignore what I've done here. I can ignore C, A, C, and E. I only want B, D, and F, which here correspond to the numbers. But of course, it's a string, so you convert it to a number. Just here, just printing it to be sure. Um, and then an error I made, which I didn't realize until kind of late, is that obviously this is done in English, like just normal counting systems, and so is this. Which means that your index is actually going to be like 1 minus, like the thing minus 1. Because if you're saying move 6 from 4, well, I mean, this is labeled 4. But in our string, this is actually um, 0, 1, 2, 3. So you kind of have to minus 1, which is something I think I did realize initially. But very common mistake just across Python. And it, it's really well hidden here. So well done to Eric with that banana skin. And then here. Yeah, you're just going through, for all of the crates you need to pick up, you're just going through picking it up and moving it across. Nothing too special there, you can probably try to figure this stuff out yourself if you're interested. Just messing with strings and stuff. Right, so once the simulation is done, I then do this bit, and T is just the answer, um, and you're just adding the top letter of each string for each tower in Q. And then you just print that out. Yes, yeah, so that's my part one. I think, it's, I think I did pretty well, I'm quite happy with, quite, quite happy with that. Lots of subtle things that I was chucked in here, just to make our lives a bit harder, which is always fun. Um, yeah, that was good. Right, let's move on to part two. Part two. 
As you watch the crane operator expertly rearrange the crates, you notice the process isn't following your prediction. Some mud was covering the writing on the side of the crane, and you quickly wipe it away. The crane is in Crate Mover 9000. It's Crate Mover 9001. Wow. Wow. These elves. Ugh. Is there even any point in saying this now? The Crate Mover 9001 is notable for many new and exciting features. Yay. Air conditioning. Leather seats. An extra cup holder. <laughs> These elves. They need the hot chocolate. And the ability to pick up and move multiple crates at once. What Eric's done here, which is really nice, is bald at this. It's like extremely easy to see. And then this is just an example. And then, yeah, the problem statement is just basically the same as before, the actual question. And that's great because, like, he's bolded, he's bolded really good bits in this problem. It's like, you can just read this, and read this, and then as well as read this. And, like, those are, like, basically all of the bold bits of this question. And, like, you can really quickly skim them and then establish what you need to do, which is kind of what I did, close enough. Um, so, yeah, I understood the problem really, really fast there. And then moving on to my solution, it's this, so obviously most of it is the same, but there are a few differences. Um, I mean the real only changes are these, this, 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 this bit, because um, instead of moving each crate one by one through a for loop, you can just like move it all through slicing, um, that's what I did here. Made two critical mistakes in this problem, first one is I copied my code across, recopied it across after I'd already written the code. So I had to rewrite it. Um, you probably saw that in the time lapse. And then the second mistake is that B. B is like the value. Um, I used the wrong variable, I used R, um, which was a mistake. But obviously like B is the right value. I just messed up my variables there. But, I mean part two is yeah not not that much different from part one. And to be honest, probably easier. Because like you don't have to use for loops or any of that stuff. Although I guess, if you don't know how to slice, it could be harder. I don't know. But yeah, that, that was my solution. Or well, my solutions. Um, pretty nice day. Really like that. Um, yeah, not much else to say there. Another two stars brings us up to double digits. Now we're 10 stars, which is nice. Although, 20% through there. I guess, 20% close to Christmas, but also 20% less programming puzzles to solve this year. Um, yeah, let's look at the calendar. Yeah, building up nice and slowly. And the leaderboard. Ooh, Red Avros is taking the throne again, keeping the throne. Lady Earth, nice, nice. Nimka still doing well, yeah. Good, nice leaderboard. Ooh. Yeah, I guess you get like the really good people who just rack up a ton of points every single day. And you saw a slow of people. Good people who have like managed to get the leaderboard a few times. But I don't. I mean, props to them, they've done well. Now, day 5, let's see. 2.40, nice. Not as insanely fast as before, but like, crazy fast still. I want to see that guy solve it. And 6.40, ooh, that's actually a bit slow. Although I guess there was a lot of code today, so it does make sense. Part 2, oh, that's Pi time, 3.14. Same guy? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, nice, that's fast. Although, this bottom time, I think, yeah, 8 minutes. So I guess, on average, it took people like another one and a bit minutes to, to solve part two from part one. Which is a bit longer than I thought, because like, realistically, you have to change such a small piece of your program. I don't know. I mean, obviously I messed up, but like, if you don't mess up, it can't have taken that long. Oh well. Maybe people had a really fast way of coding part one. That meant coding part two was a hassle. Let's look at the stats. 100k people have now done both stars of days one to four. Although I feel like today is going to throw off a bit of people. Although having said that, 63,000. And like, the problem was already released 13 hours ago. So, I reckon that number might actually reach 100,000. And um, in fact, Eric, um, on Twitter, um, earlier today, he was like, we now have 1 million people registered for AOC. And like, that's faster than last year. Um, I think last year it took until like day 7 or 8 to get that many people registered. Epic work for him. Let's look at our private leaderboard. Anonymous still rain. Oh, big, big, big boundary, big gap. See, Abner's climbed up a little, which is nice. He's wicking up on time now. A couple of new names in here as well. But yeah, how many people? 
probably gonna order it from stars because as people solve it at different times, like me, I'll end up really low down. So yeah, 33 people have done all 10 stars in our school, that's nice, that's very good. Um, global score. Yeah, no changes, no global scores for anyone today. Let's look at delta times. Yeah, these are some nice delta times, pretty fast. Quite like it. Yeah, my delta time completely, because I completely messed that up. Um, but yeah, this two girls, pretty slow actually. <laughs> Don't tell I said that, but pretty slow. And anonymous, even slower. Oh, Mr. Dr. Danish though, fair enough, what did he get? Oh, he came, he didn't do that well today. <laughs> he came third overall, but I think these are, yeah, anonymous just grabbing all the goals. Um, yeah, not bad, nice. Times. Oh wow, yeah, these were pretty close to the boundary, I guess. Anyway, yeah, there's some fast coding. I like I like the day so far. They were pretty fast paced, really fun. Tons of variety, tons of thinking, lots of code. Always great to see that. Um, super, super excited to see what's up with tomorrow. Um, I think it's going to be a fun one, really fun one. The day was good, I liked it. Probably my favourite day so far, because there's a lot of implementation as well as the algorithm, which is lovely. And you can actually guess the problem without reading a whole lot of it. <laughs> Always love doing that. So yeah, that's day 5 of Avid Code 2022. Hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully you, you had your own solution, which, which worked. Um, one of the 63,000 people so far that have got it right. Um, and yeah, see you tomorrow for day 6 of Avid Code 2022. Bye.